Hello and welcome to this lecture which we, we've covered Marxism so far. In this lecture we're going to cover the divisions in socialism which emerged from the late 19th century onwards. And uh, not coincidentally these divisions emerged around the same time as both modern liberalism and also one nation conservatism. So up until around about, we can say around about, well the late 19th century, 1870s, 1880s, Socialists were pretty much unanimous in the answer to two key questions. Firstly, does capitalism need to be abolished? And secondly, is revolution necessary to achieve this? Up until that point, socialists, especially Marxists, had been pretty much agreed uh, that the answer to both these questions was a resounding yes. Capitalism does need to be abolished and revolution is necessary to achieve this. The previous lectures explained why they believed this was the case. Um, but from... Around the late 19th century, differences of opinion emerged within socialism on both these questions. So we'll take each of them in turn. First of all, by the later part of the 19th century, socialists such as a group called the Fabians began to believe that perhaps revolution was not necessary in order to achieve socialism. Now just pause the video here and think why by the late 19th century some socialists might have thought revolution was no longer necessary to achieve socialism or put another way why did they think a different route to power was now possible other than revolution so pause the video and have a think did you get it yeah that's right the expansion of the franchise so Disraeli's second reform act of 1867 had extended the vote to some workers for the first time and this led many socialists to believe that a parliamentary road to socialism was now possible, that socialism could be voted into power by the working class. So the Fabians, led by thinkers such as Beatrice Webb, developed a theory called, quote, the inevitability of gradualism, the inevitability of gradualism. By this, they meant that the gradual, peaceful attainment of socialism was now inevitable, bound to happen. And there were basically four steps to their reasoning. So step one, they said, well, the franchise is being steadily extended, first in 1832, then in 1867, again in 1881, and so on. They believed it was only a matter of time before the franchise would be extended to the whole adult population. Pause the video here for a second. Were they correct in this belief? The answer is, yes, they were. Universal adult suffrage, that is the extension of the franchise to all adult citizens, admittedly except prisoners, was achieved in the UK, at least for general elections, by what date? Pause the video here and answer. That's right, 1928. So the second step of their argument was that, well, if we have universal adult suffrage, that is to say if the whole adult population has the vote, that will put political power in the hands of the working class because the working class constitutes the numerical majority of the adult population. The third step of their reasoning was perhaps the most open to contestation. They believed, as did most liberals and many conservatives at the time as well, by the way, that if the working class had the vote, they would inevitably vote for socialism because socialism is the ideology that it represents the interests of the working class. This is the part of the argument that has not been perhaps so well borne out by the test of history. Despite having had universal adult suffrage in this country since 1928, we've never had a socialist government elected if we define socialism in the sense of seeking the complete abolition of capitalism. However, we have a party that considers itself socialist who've been elected repeatedly, that is to say the Labour Party. And furthermore, to retain electoral viability, the Conservatives, especially in the 50s and 60s, were forced to adopt many elements of Labour's arguably socialist program, which, um, such as redistribution of wealth, progressive taxation, the welfare state, free health and education, etc. Even Thatcher did not dare to abolish the NHS or progressive income tax, so perhaps the Fabians were right on that front as well. It depends how you define socialism. Now, the fourth step of the Fabians' argument was that once a socialist government was elected, it was set about abolishing capitalism gradually and peacefully through parliamentary statute. Again, history has not borne this out, as Labour governments have generally not sought to abolish capitalism, but rather to manage capitalism in the interests of the working class. So this brings us to the second division that emerged within socialism in the late 19th century on the issue of capitalism itself. So, by the end of the 19th century, argued revisionists, revisionists like Edward Bernstein, Many of Marx's predictions had not come about. 
For example, Bernstein argued that society was not becoming as polarised as Marx had predicted, with an ever-growing increase between rich and poor, but rather there was a growth of the middle class. Furthermore, far from collapsing under the weight of its own contradictions, capitalism had actually proved much more durable than Marx had predicted. In parts of Europe, especially in Germany, trade union struggles, combined with the rise of working class political parties and the extension of the franchise, had given some workers some power within capitalism, which had brought about improvement of their wages and working conditions. So revisionists such as Bernstein argued that perhaps capitalism did not need to be overthrown after all. In fact, capitalism seemed to be a pretty efficient means of producing wealth. So long as capitalism was controlled by working class parties in government, he argued, it could be perhaps made to serve the interests of the working class. It would need to be highly regulated and controlled. Um, all socialists believe that capitalism, if left to its own devices, in other words, laissez-faire capitalism, was exploitative and unjust. But in the right hands, in the hands of the working class, the wealth produced by capitalism could be distributed more equitably. More equitably. This type of socialism, which advocated the reform, the control and management of capitalism, rather than its abolition, became known as social democracy. So now you had two distinct branches, two main distinct branches of socialism. On the one hand, you had revolutionary socialism such as Marxism, which argued capitalism need to be, needed to be abolished by revolution. And on the other, you had social democracy, which argued that capitalism need to be, needed to be reformed rather than abolished, brought under the control of the working class, uh, regulated in their interests, and that socialists should come to power through elections rather than revolution. We should note here, though, that the Fabians we mentioned earlier, part of a trend known as democratic socialism, belong to a third category, who believed that capitalism should be abolished. So they were so-called fundamentalist socialists, to use Andrew Hayward's taxonomy in that sense. But capitalism should be abolished by peaceful means rather than revolution. Social democracy, however, the tendency advocating non-revolutionary reform of capitalism became the dominant strain of socialism in the Western world. And social democracy reached its peak really in the three decades after the Second World War, the period known as the post-war boom. Labour came to power in a landslide election victory in 1945 and instituted a set of radical reforms, including the creation of the NHS, the creation of a universal welfare state, in which benefits were paid to all those without income, whether due to illness, old age or unemployment, and the nationalisation of huge swathes of industry, including gas, electricity, coal, steel, railways and so on. Income tax on the rich was very high, and Keynesian demand management was the order of the day, managing capitalism. Uh, for the next three decades, these were the policies followed by both conservative and labour governments in the period known as the post-war consensus. So successful were these policies that by the 1950s, social democrats such as Anthony Crossland argued that capitalism was no longer an inherently contradictory system and that Keynesian Keynesianism had effectively made it into a sustainable wealth generating machine, which had overcome the old tendencies towards overproduction crises. Social democracy appeared to have created a reformed capitalism able to generate increasing living standards for all in a sustained and sustainable way. Now, however, Marxism did not go away. Marx, in fact, across the world, Marxists were leading revolutionary struggles. Um, particular in Asia, Africa and Latin America. And Marxists continued to believe that capitalism needed to be overthrown and that it would need a revolution to achieve it. Capitalism, even if it were to temporarily resolve its tendency to overproduction crisis, Marxists believed this was not permanent. And even this temporary staving off of crisis had only been achieved by the most monstrous destruction of capital, namely the Second World War, at a cost of over 100 million violent deaths, the biggest mass killing in human history. Not only this, but capitalism had been sustained largely by shifting the bulk of its exploitation to the third world, Africa, Asia and Latin America. Crossland was only able to write about the rosy uplands of capitalist Britain because Britain had created an impoverished proletariat in its colonies who continued to serve as super exploited workers even after the granting of formal independence. And even under the supposedly socialist Labour government of 1945 to 51, Britain was almost continually at war with countries resisting their place in the global economic system. 
Atli's government alone waged brutal wars against communist movements in Malaysia, Greece and Korea, for example. And the, and the Labour government of Harold Wilson in the 1960s oversaw the ethnic cleansing of the Chagos Islands in the Pacific, for example, expelling the entire population from their historic homeland to make way for a US military base in the middle of the Vietnam War. Britain has actually been at war somewhere in the world every year since World War II, except for 1968. For Marxists, then, this is the true face of capitalism. Degradation, poverty and mass killing. And a few years of rising living standards in a handful of privileged countries should not blind us to this reality. Furthermore, not only did capitalism still need to be abolished, but it still required a revolution to do so. Even though the workers had the vote, at least in some countries, Marxists argued that the state was not a neutral instrument which could simply be turned towards the goals of socialism, rather it was an instrument of class rule, an instrument for the repression and domination of one class by another. The bourgeois state then could not be simply taken over and used as an instrument of socialism. This was the argument used by later Marxists such as Rosa Luxemburg. And her, her point was graphically demonstrated when she herself was murdered uh, with the connivance of the police under a supposedly socialist government in Germany in 1919. It was demonstrated again when Salvador Allende was elected president of Chile. He was a democratic socialist committing, committed to abolishing capitalism through peaceful parliamentary means, but the state which he supposedly controlled refused to obey him. And in 1973, the general of his own army, one Augustus Pinochet, overthrew him in a military coup, banned his political party and executed an estimated 30,000 of his supporters. So that's why the Marxists believed uh, that despite all of the arguments made by the Social Democrats, capitalism still needed to be abolished. It hadn't overcome its overproduction crises. It still led to poverty and degradation and killing across most of the planet. And it still needed to be abolished by revolution and couldn't simply be abolished by parliamentary statute.